Okay, let's welcome Larry Hastings, aka DS Dad, for the removal of the gill. <laughs> Uh, yes, this is a talk about the galectomy, which is a project to remove the gill from CPython. Um, let me preface my comments by saying uh, this talk is going to be exceedingly technical. Uh, I'm just going to go right into the heart of the matter. And so it's kind of designed for people who are already core developers who are familiar with the internals of CPython. Um, I'm hoping that you'll understand multi-threading pretty well. I'm hoping that you'll know at least a vague understanding of how uh, CPython works internally, the concepts of like uh, objects and the reference counts on objects. Um, uh, also, uh, if you don't understand this stuff, a good thing to do would be to watch my talk from last year. I didn't give it here, but I, I gave it at um, uh, other talk. Uh, no, I did give it here, actually. Um, it's called uh, Python's Infamous Gill. It's on YouTube. Um, and it'd be really good if you could go back in time and watch it before you came in the door. Um, anyway, uh, so let's talk about the gill. The gill was added in 1992, and barring the addition of a condition variable to enforce fairness, it has remained essentially unchanged in the 24 years since then. Um, and I want to make it clear, uh, the gill is a wonderful design. It really solved the problem. It was a fabulous design for 1992. It really still holds up today in a lot of ways. Um, but there are some ramifications from this design. So first of all, the gill is very simple. So it's really easy to get right. Um, C extension developers don't have any trouble understanding how to use the gill. Um, uh, internally, we would never have any problem about owning the gill or not owning the gill when we're supposed to or not supposed to. Um, since there's only one gill, we can't have deadlocks. Um, there's only one lock. You can't have a deadlock between the more than one locks. And since you only ever run into a single thread, um, there is almost no overhead of switching between um, the gill. We do it only when we switch threads. Um, so your code goes real fast. Um, the gill adds very little overhead to your code. Now, if you're single-threaded, your code is going to run really fast. Uh, this is a really great design for single-threaded code. If you're um, IO-bound and multi-threaded, um, this works great. Um, if, and this was actually the original design for what uh, threading was for, back when all computers were a single processor anywhere, almost all of them. Um, it's problem, the problem is when you want to have a CPU-bound program and you want to run on multiple cores simultaneously because you just can't. And that is the pain point of the gill. Um, so uh, again, in 1992, all the computers around us were all uh, single core, even the big servers. But the world has changed since 1992. These days, we have these wonderful laptops, which are multi-core. And even our phones are multi-core. And our wristwatches and our eyeglasses have all gone multi-core. I have a workstation at home that has um, 28 cores in it. Uh, if you count hyper-threading, it has 56 cores. We live in a deeply multi-core world, and Python is kind of ill-appraised to take advantage of that. I want to point out, uh, this comment is still in the CPython source code today. Um, CPython has only rudimentary thread support. Uh, I suggest that maybe it's time to consider adding more sophisticated threading support to CPython. After all, um, the goal of a programming language really should be to expose all of the uh, various things that your computer can do to you, take advantage of all of the different resources your computer offers. And Python can use all of them, except for the multiple cores that you have. So it's kind of a sore point. Now, there was an attempt back in the 90s, uh, this thing called the free threading patch. Um, this was added to, this was an attempt in Python 1.4, uh, done in 1999, to get rid of the gill. Um, it didn't require changing the API, so it didn't break C extensions, which was a good design. Um, what it did is it moved most of the uh, global variables inside the interpreter into a single structure. Um, and it added a, a single mutex lock around inker and decker. And I believe there was a Windows variant of it at the time that used uh, inter interlocked increment and interlocked decrement, which is a Win32 API that's equivalent to atomic inker and decker. Um, but the single mutex lock uh, was a little on the slow side. Um, it, your program would run between four and seven times slower, um, which, let's be clear, what everyone wants, they want to get rid of the gill because they want to use multiple cores because they want their program to go faster. So when I say, oh, we removed the gill and it goes slower, nobody's excited. So this was not a very exciting patch at the time. Uh, if you want to read more about it, there was a lovely blog post by David Beasley a couple of years ago and got it to run on modern hardware. This is called An Inside Look at the Gill Removal Patch of Lore. And um, I looked at that too. But let's talk about what I'm doing now. So the galectomy. Um, I have a plan to remove the gill, and actually what I should say is that I have removed the gill. I removed the gill back in April. 
The problem is that it's terribly slow. So, um, uh, but uh, in order to remove the gill, you kind of need to have a plan in place. You, there, are, there are a bunch of considerations you must account for in order to remove the gill and have the, the project like, be successful and maybe get merged or used by people someday. So uh, I say that there are four technical considerations you must address when you are going to remove the gill. Those are reference counting. Uh, again, every, every object in the CPython runtime has a reference count that tracks the object lifetime. Um, and uh, this is traditionally kind of unfriendly to multi-threaded approaches. Um, there are global and static variables. There aren't nearly as many as I thought there were, uh, but there are a couple. Um, there's some per-thread information, which I think all lives in one place now. Um, there's a bunch of shared singleton objects, like um, all the small integers, like uh, negative 1 through 16 or something like that. Um, none, true, false, empty, uh, tuple. Um, these are all, Python creates one of them, and every time you use an empty tuple, it uses the same empty tuple everywhere, because it's immutable. Um, you need to address uh, extensions, C extensions, currently run in a, this wonderful world where they don't have to worry about locking because the Glow protects them. Um, they've never run in a world where they could be called from multiple threads at the same time. They've certainly never run in a world where multiple threads could run in the same function at the same time. And so there's a lot of code that depends on only a single thread running in the function, like, you know, if static thing is equal to null, then initialize static thing. All that sort of code is just going to break when we go multi-core. And finally, we need to worry about the atomicity of operations in, C Python, in, in Python. So the, um, the developers of the other Python um, uh, implementations, PyPy and uh, more strongly IronPython and Jython, they discover that a lot of CPython code uh, implicitly expects a lot of operations to be atomic in CPython. If you ad append to a list or if you set a value in a dict, um, another thread could be examining that object and it must not see that dict or that list in an incomplete state. It needs to either see it before the uh, append has happened or after the append has happened. So we need to guarantee that atomicity of operation, that you can never see an object in an incomplete state from another thread. But in addition to these four technical considerations, I say that there are three political considerations that we must address, because um, it's not simply a technical uh, solution, we need to also make sure that the CPython, like there's a whole world of people using CPython out there, um, and there are demands that are going to be made on uh, removing the gill that are not strictly technical demands. Um, I say that these are, we need to not hurt single-threaded performance. This was actually something that Guido established in a blog post, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but uh, we need to not make single-threaded code slower, we not make multi-threaded IO-bound code slower. That's a very high bar to meet. We need to not break C extensions. This is sort of my uh, statement. Uh, CPython 3.0 broke every C extension out there, and it's been however many years, five years, six years, since uh, CPython 3.0 came out, and there are still plenty of extensions out there that haven't upgraded to the new extension API. We need to try and avoid breaking C extensions as much as possible. And finally, don't make it too complicated. And of course, this is a, uh, this is a judgment call. But um, CPython, one of the things that's really lovely about CPython is that it's pretty easy to work on. Internally, it's not all that complicated. Um, it's conceptually very simple. Um, it's, the code is very clean. And it would be a shame if we broke that uh, feature of the CPython source code in order to get rid of the gill. So let's try and preserve that. Now, there are a couple of approaches that people have talked about, um, ways to get rid of the gill. Um, that I don't think will work. And so just as to sort of set the stage, I want to talk about those um, for, for a minute or two. Um, there's what I call tracing garbage collection. This is also mark and sweep garbage collection. Um, this would let us get rid of reference counting. And again, reference counting is traditionally very difficult to do in a multi-threaded environment. Um, so this would, be, um, this would be very favorable to multi-threading. Um, tracing garbage collection, um, it's not clear whether it would be faster or slower than reference counting would be. The traditional wisdom about this, conventional wisdom says that uh, garbage collection and good reference counting implementations are about the same speed. And then people like to argue, but that's the internet for you. Um, where this falls down is that this is going to break every C extension out there. Um, it's a very different world going to pure garbage collection as opposed to reference counting. And so C extensions are just not going to work anymore. So that breaks every C extension. I say we kind, kind of can't afford to do it politically. 
And it also will be very complicated. Um, it's a much more complicated API than reference scanning. Reference scan is a relatively simple API. And still, people mess it up. You know, it can be, it can be a little uh, obscure at times. It can be a little hard to figure out exactly what the right thing is to do with reference counting. Garbage collection, I think, is going to be that much worse. M even more so than tracing garbage collection is what's called software transactional memory. Um, Armin Rigo, who just showed up today, um, he's been working on uh, software transactional memory as a research project with the PyPy interpreter for a couple of years now. And um, it sounds like a fantastic technology. Um, is it going to be fast enough? Yes, absolutely. If software transactional memory works, it's going to be really fast. It's going to be really great. It's going to take wonderful advantage of multiple cores, and you're going to have very little locking involved. But it really falls down on the other two. It's going to break every C extension out there horribly. Um, it's going to be incredibly complicated internally. Also, again, this is research quality stuff right now. And it's not clear to anybody when it's going to be ready for production. Um, and I don't think that CPython is able to wait. So let's move on. Let's talk about my proposal and the specifics of my proposal. So again, I said there were those four technical considerations. The first is reference counting. What I say is, we keep reference counting. Uh, that way, we don't break C extensions. So it's going to be the same API that we have now, PyAnchor and PyDecker. Um, the important thing is that the compile time C API does not change. Now, um, like I said, I got rid of the GIL in April. And what I did is I switched to what's called Atomic Inker and Decker. Um, this is where the CPU itself um, ha provides you with an instruction that says, I can add one or subtract one to this memory address and do it in such a way that it's not possible to have a race condition with another core. It works great. Costs us 30% of, uh, of speed right off the top. Um, so this is working great, and this, is, this means that our programs are correct, um, but it's awfully slow, and we're going to look for alternate approaches here. Um, global and static variables, um, we kind of handle that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, again, for the, all the per-thread stuff has already been moved into pipe-thread state for me. I guess I was done a couple of years ago. I hadn't noticed. Um, so that's ready to go. Um, shared singletons, um, they just remain shared. All those shared objects, like the small integers and null or uh, none, excuse me, uh, and true and false, those just get shared between threads, and that's the whole point of uh, getting rid of the gill and running multiple threads, is that C Python programs don't change. Um, C extension parallelism and reentry, there's just nothing for it. Um, they're going to be running in a multi-core world, and they're going to be called multiple times for multiple core, uh, multiple threads simultaneously, and they just need to get, rid of, get with the program. So it's going to break C extensions all over the place. Uh, atomicity of operations. We're just going to add a whole bunch of locks. Every uh, object in CPython that is mutable will have a lock on it, and it will have to be locked while you're performing the mutable operation. So this is going to add a new locking API to CPython. Um, they're going to be macros, pylock, and pyonlock. This is going to call a turn into the uh, pytype object, which is going to have sprout in two new uh, members, oblock and obunlock, which I'm guessing will be uh, uh, exposed to Python programs as dunder lock and dunder unlock. Um, all these functions, they uh, only take one parameter, which is the object to lock or unlock, and they return void because they always work. Um, in, for objects that are immutable, um, my claim is that uh, this oblock and ob unlock, those can be null. So you just either you support locking or you don't, and if you don't support locking, then you don't even need the functions and you can just skip them. So what objects need locking? It's all mutable objects. And when I say all mutable objects, I mean C mutable, not just Python mutable. For example, consider the stir object. Um, and from the Python perspective, stirs are immutable, right? But internally, they have a couple of lazily computed fields, um, like the hash. Um, the hash is initially initialized to negative 1, which, by the way, if you ever looked at the hash function, it says it will never return negative 1. Negative 1 means uninitialized internally. So that's why a negative 1 value is an illegal hash value in Python. So it's initialized to negative 1, and then the first time somebody says, give me the hash of this object, of this stir object, it goes and computes it, stores it, and returns that. Um, so that's mutable state. Now, in the case of the hash, that's harmless. If we had two threads, and they both saw the negative 1, they both compute the hash, they both override it, well, they're going to be overriding with the same number. So that's harmless. But there are two more fields, UTF-8 and WSTIR, both of these are also lazily computed. These are conversions to uh, UTF-8 or, or uh, UTF-16, respectively. And um, those allocate memory. And if there was a race where they saw null and they both all go off and allocate memory and they both overwrite, you're going um, to leak memory at that point. 
So we're going to have to put a lock around those. So the store object is currently not safe, and I haven't dealt with it yet. So uh, right now, we can leak memory inside of CPython. It's terrible. Um, so every object is going to be locked inside of the galactamine, which means that we have to have as light a lock as possible. Um, I would call this a user space lock. Uh, under Linux, uh, we have this wonderful thing called a Futex, um, which is literally a lock. You can declare any four-byte aligned memory address is a lock, and you can wait on it. Um, it's really more of like a building block for writing your own mutexes uh, and, um, and other synchronization objects. Uh, it's really great. Windows, for 20 years, has had what they call the critical section, um, which is user space only until there is contention. And uh, OS X has what they call pthread mutex. Um, a couple of people now have told me that pthread mutex is guaranteed to be user space only until there is contention. So we have the user space locks that we need um, for all of the major platforms. Um, I don't know about the other platforms, Solaris and FreeBSD and all those sorts of things. Somebody else is going to do that work. But all of the major platforms that Python runs on, we're going to have the support for user space locks that we need. Or maybe they don't get a no-go Python. We'll, we'll see. Now, as for the political considerations, um, for my approach the, with the galactomy, I would say that, yes, it's not going to uh, be any slower, and yes, it's not going to break C extensions. Now, this may be crazy because I'm declaring, I just told you a couple minutes ago I was going to break every C extension out there because of uh, atomicity of operations, and I'm making it 30% slower by adding um, uh, Atomic Inger and Decker for um, uh, reference counting. Uh, so how can those two statements be true at the same time? The answer is that I'd say that we have to just have two builds. So uh, we would have Python built with the gil and without the gil. You build it with the gil, and everything's the same as it is today. And that way, all the C extensions continue to work. That would be the default build for everybody on every platform. And then, if you're some sort of futuristic person who wants to live in the multi-core world, you can build Python in the special no gil version at which point the um, pi lock and pi unlock start to work. So these macros, these pi begin allow thread and end allow thread, these pi lock and pi unlock, those would either be no ops or active, depending on which build you were in. If you had a gil, then begin allow thread and end allow thread did something, and pi lock and pi unlock would be no ops. If you don't have a gil, then lock and unlock are going to do something, and begin and end allow thread are probably no ops, although I may hide some work in there. Um, this also means that um, a C extension will never accidentally run with the wrong build because we can have different entry points for each one. Um, if you have a gil, if you have a module just called module, then you have an entry point called init module. We could say, okay, if you run with, in the without gil build version, then we're going to have a different entry point with a no gil in front or something just to make them two different entry points. That way, um, no one will ever run in a no-gil build accidentally, um, and it's strictly opt-in. No XC extension will run a no-gil build until they're ready, until they declare themselves that they have a no-gil entry point. You might actually be able to build a single ex uh, extension that worked in both, by the way. Um, we could add, those other things are macros, we could add actual C functions for them. And if you were very careful, you might be able to write a, C a single .so that supported both modes. I don't know if that's interesting or not, it's just something that I'm mentioning. Um, as long as we're effectively declaring a new C API, because this is really what this is at this point, is kind of a new C API. It looks very similar to the existing C API, uh, but it has this, you know, reference counting. It works a little differently, and um, uh, the atomicity of operations means you have to have locking all over the place, and you can't guarantee that you're going to only run on a single thread in this, uh, at a time. Um, this might be a good time to start inflicting some best practices on people that currently are, op are optional. Um, it's actually true in CPython that you can declare your own type statically and you can create an object with it and you can pass it into the CPython runtime and the CPython has never seen this object or this type before and it has to work. Um, we could stop allowing that. There's a function you're supposed to call called PyTypeReady that's optional and we could say, okay, now it's required. Um, by the same token, there's a new PEP called PEP489. This is this thing called multi-phase C extension initialization. Um, I don't really understand it, but it has something to do with initializing C extensions, and I was like, well, that's very relevant. So this might be a good time to say, all these things that used to be optional, now they're required. If you're going to run a no-go build, you have to call PyType Ready, you have to call PEP489, you probably have to use the limited C API, all those sorts of things. Now where this, this galectomy idea falls down is the don't make it too complicated idea. Um, it is getting a little complicated because we're effectively talking about two different builds um, running at the same time from the same source base. 
So a C Python core developer would have to read the code and say, oh, PyLock, that's only active in the NoGill build. Oh, Py, um, uh, begin allow threading, that's only active in the WithGill build. And so they're going to have to sort of read every bit of code twice to see how it's going to react in with Gill and without Gill. Um, you're also going to have to be very careful about where you lock. But ultimately, this is the price we're going to have to pay in order to get rid of the Gill. I don't see any simpler way of doing it. Now, as I said, um, this is something I've been working on for a couple of months. I think I started in February. Um, initially, I was calling this whole thing Confuse-a-Cat uh, just to pick something from Monty Python. Uh, but then the, the name Galectomy came up and like, well, that was, I was done. That was the name. Now, as I mentioned, back in 2007, Guido wrote a blog post called It Isn't Easy to Remove the Gill, um, where he talks about what would have to happen in order to remove the gill. And um, I agree with everything in this paper that he wrote. It's all um, really insightful, except for the title. Turns out, if you know where to start, you can remove the gill in about a week. Here's how. Step one, or step zero, really, atomic inker and decker. You switch pi inker and pi decker, to use uh, uh, Atomic inker and, inker and Decker. Um, I only support 64-bit uh, Linux right now, so I just uh, went to GCC and used the intrinsics. Um, so I only support GCC right now. Uh, number one, you have to pick what kind of lock you're going to use. Again, on Linux, I'm using uh, Futex-based locks. Um, there's a paper from Ulrich Drepper called Futexes Are Tricky, where he walks you through how to write a mutex based on Futexes, and I'm basically using his design. Step two, you need to write, uh, throw locks around the entire dict object. You cannot run a CPython interpreter without having working dict, and so the dict object needs to be safe. So you just need to go through every external entry point, any place where someone is calling into the dict object from outside, you need to make sure that it's locked properly and unlocked properly. Step three is same thing with the list. Again, uh, CPython uses dicts and lists internally for a lot of operations, and you just can't have a working C interpreter unless you've got both of those working. Step four. Um, there are about 10 free lists inside of CPython, where um, when you allocate an object, um, it looks to see if there's a free one waiting, and if there is, it just uses that, and if there isn't, it has to go off to the allocator. These free lists make things go a little bit faster, but obviously they're not thread safe yet, so you need to add a lock around them, and you need to do that about 10 times. Step five, you need to disable the garbage collector and uh, GC track and untrack. Like, the garbage collector is just completely broken in, in the galactomy right now. Uh, it's going to be quite a while before we get that working again. So, um, which actually, by the way, makes, it, uh, makes my numbers look a little better than they really should, because there should be some garbage collection overhead that I don't have. But um, the garbage collector is just completely, totally broken in the galectomy, and it's just completely shut off right now. Uh, step six, you need to actually murder the gill. Um, this was a pleasure when I got to do that part. Um, there's just a structure, you, you just like, don't allocate that uh, variable anymore take all of the things that are switching the gill and just stub them out or comment them out or whatever, and they all go away. Um, step seven, um, there's a, when you switch threads with uh, C Python internally, there is a thread state that's stored in a global variable, and everyone just refers to that. So whatever thread you're on, they just look in the same spot, and that's always the information about the current thread. And obviously, you can't do that anymore if you're running multiple threads simultaneously. So instead, um, every time that people refer to that, they're actually going through a macro. You just need to change the macro so that it pulls that thread state variable out of thread local storage. Um, that was actually pretty easy to get working, because everyone's using the macros. Everyone's really good about it. And finally, you need to fix some tests. Um, specifically, there were only a couple of tests that really broke when I did this. Um, mainly, they were sensitive to ex testing exactly how big the dict object and li list object were. And now that I'd added this lock to it, um, they had gotten a little bit bigger, and I just needed to fix those. And actually, the um, entire Python um, regression test suite started to work, apart from the stuff that was um, actually using threads. And there were a couple of those. So back at the Language Summit, uh, I announced that it was about three and a half times slower by wall time and about 25 times slower at CPU time. What I mean by that is um, I was running a test. This, I run the test the same way every time. I run seven threads, all running the same program, and I time it. And I did it with normal CPython, and I did it with uh, removing the gill, galectomy CPython. And um, when I did that with seven cores, it was three, three and a half times slower if you would just watch the clock on the wall. But if you count up how much CPU time was used, well, I was using seven cores as opposed to normal CPython, just using one core. And so you multiply that number by seven, and it's about 25. So um, 25 times slower to do the same amount of work, which is kind of depressing. 
Um, so this is the official benchmark of the galactomy. This is what everyone has been running. It's a really bad Fibonacci generator. Um, I'm showing you this just to impress on you how horrible the benchmarking is so far, um, how, much, how, how little code I can run through a multi-core um, CPython right now. But this does work, uh, and I can run it on uh, multiple cores simultaneously. Um, it's not exercising very much code inside of, C of CPython. Um, it's looking up the fib function over and over and over in the module dict. So there's a single dict that's just getting slammed with lookup requests. And since it's locked, that means that there's just some contention around that lock. Um, we're performing a function call, which has always got some, uh, it's a pretty heavyweight operation in CPython. We're running a little bit of bytecode. Um, we're talking to the small integers, like two and one and zero, and actually all of the small integers, because of the way fib works. Like, you use all those small integers a whole lot. And again, the small integers are shared between threads, and uh, they all have reference counts, which means that we're changing those reference counts constantly from multiple threads, um, which is costing us a lot of performance, it turns out. And we're doing a little bit of math, and the math really isn't hurting us at all. So this is what it looks like. Um, I got some flack for not labeling my axes, so there, I've labeled my axes. Um, the, the vertical is time in seconds, horizontal is number of cores that are being used, and um, this is gill versus galectomy. So um, the, having the gill is the blue line. It's way faster to have a gill right now. And with the galectomy, uh, this shows you that it's taking, it's, it seems to be curving off. So at some point, it might actually go be, it might not be making it that much slower to add a core to it, but that's going to be a way, way out. There's also this dip around four. I don't know why it's there. I think it's just the way that the tests interleaved. I would say ignore it, assume it's not there. But I had to show it because that's what my data actually showed. But uh, more interesting, again, this was really uh, wall time. I think CPU time is more interesting. So um, the, number, the amount of time that it took to compute these seven uh, Fibonacci numbers, it was Fib of 30, I think. Um, in CPython, it's next to nothing. You compare that with running it with the galactomy, and it just goes crazy up. So um, obviously, it's incredibly slower. How much slower? Um, this is a graph of how many times slower it is per core um, comparing uh, normal CPython to the galactomy version. And again, there's this dip around four. I would say ignore it. But what this is telling us is that um, it's about twice as slow with one core, and then it shoots up to about 10 times slower with two cores, and then it just keeps going, and going up and up and up. I think um, uh, seven, core, seven cores is about 19 times slower here. So why is it so slow? Um, after all, the Galactomy isn't changing that much code, um, or at least not yet. So the first thing I would say is that I don't know for certain. Um, it's kind of hard to measure. Um, at the uh, sprints at, uh, at uh, PyCon a couple months, uh, I guess early June at that point, um, there were some Intel guys who hung out with me, and they ran it under Vtune, and they kind of confirmed some suspicions here. Uh, the second thing is actually lock contention, and that's what everyone was probably assuming was number one, but it's actually number two. Number one is synchronization and cache misses. Um, this is what's really slamming um, uh, the galectomy. Um, something to consider is that uh, nothing inside of CPython is private. So like a, a normal multi-core program you might write, um, you might design it around being multi-core, and you'd have, okay, here's this thing that's thread local to this one and thread local to that one. There's almost nothing in CPython that's thread local. Everything is shared across all cores all the time, and all the cores want to talk to them simultaneously, and that's kind of uh, the fundamental thing that's killing performance, is that we really don't have any thread-specific stuff. So let's talk for a minute about why things are slow and fast. So, um, oh, that disappeared. Okay, so um, this is cache. Um, your computers at this point have three levels of cache between them and the RAM that they're talking to. And if it's 1x to talk to level 1 cache, and level 2 cache is about two times as slow, and level 3 cache is 10 times as slow, and talking to RAM itself is about 15 times slower. So you want to be talking to cache. Com computer CPUs are so fast, that normal slow RAM can't keep up with them anymore. So we have all of this elaborate caching going in between. And if we can keep the cache fed, we can keep the CPU fed, we can keep your program running. At the point that we break the cache, we're going to start slowing down your program a great deal. And that's really what's going on in, C in uh, the galactomy is that the cache never gets to warm up. So let's, just as an example, these are all new slides I made this morning. So let's talk about, uh, let's have, we have a program. We've got um, four cores, zero, one, two, and three and we have uh, the number two. And we're running the Galectomy version of CPython, and we're running our Fibonacci benchmark, which is using the number two a whole lot. So all of them currently have the number two in cache. Um, so if they want to look at the number two, they can just look at it, and they've already got it accessed. They don't have to wait. But then let's say that one of these uh, 
cores is going to actually do something with the number two, so it's going to pi increment the number. So it's going to change the reference count. So core one is changing the reference count, it's incrementing it, and that means that the number two has changed. That memory has changed, which means that it must now um, invalidate the cache for all the other cores for that cache line. And that cache line is 64 bytes, which is more than enough to cover the entire long object. And so now, none of the other cores have that uh, number in cache anymore. And so the next time they want to talk to the number two, they have to go load it. Um, Armin tells me that they can actually talk to the other core and maybe pull it, but it's still a lot slower than simply having it in cache ready to go. So it's, this is happening constantly. Anytime that you examine an object in CPython, you change its reference count. Anytime you change its reference count, you are changing the memory. Anytime you change the memory, you are invalidating the cache for all the other cores, which means that the more cores you add, the slower you go. And that's what I'm observing in my numbers. So there is a solution for this, or at least a, a combination of approaches for a solution. Um, there is a technique called buffered reference counting. Uh, we're going to use this in combination with something else. So this is what it, how it works now conceptually. These, these blue boxes at the bottom, these are supposed to be cores. And this lighter blue box with the O, that's representing an object O. So all of them are talking to this O directly. So right now, if you want to examine an object, you increment its reference count. When you increment its reference count, you just go and do it. You reach into the object, you change the number. Um, that means that we have to synchronize that across cores. So we're using this atomic Ingram Decker, which is slow. We'd like to do something a little bit faster. So, why don't we change it so that we can use, uh, why don't, if we could change it so that all changes to reference counts were done from a single thread, then we wouldn't have to use atomic Inker and Decker anymore. We could just use what I would call unsynchronized Inker and Decker. It'd be a lot faster. We can do that. All we do is we change it so that instead of writing the reference count directly, we write into a, a log, a, a big memory buffer that just gets reference count changes in it. So every time you want to change the reference count on an object, you don't change it directly. Instead, you write it in the log. You say, oh, add one to the reference count. You just write that into the log, and you don't worry about it. And meanwhile, there's this other thread, this fourth blue box where I wrote commit. That's the commit thread. That's the guy who's going to actually make the reference count changes. So he walks the log and sees, oh, I should add one to the reference count for O, and he just goes and does it. But he's the only thread making reference count changes, so he can use unsynchronized Inker and Decker. That's great. The problem is we've, all we've done is moved the contention. Now instead of having contention around the reference counts, we have contention around this log. So we need to lock and unlock the log. We really haven't solved any problems. But we can fix that. So let's go to a single log per thread. Now, when thread 0 wants to increment uh, the reference count on O, it writes into this reference count log. And then the, th the commit thread comes along and makes that change. Now we have a single log per thread, and we have a single thread making the changes. There's no synchronization overhead, hardly at all. We need to have a little bit when we swap these buffers around. That's great. Now we have an ordering problem. Let's say that thread one is running along, and let's say that our object O is stored in a list, and this is the only place where it's stored. Um, and all the reference counts have settled out, um, so there's a reference count of one on O right now, and that's the reference where L, the list L is holding a reference to that object. So um, thread one comes along and it says, oh, I'm going to iterate over the list and just print everything in it. And then thread zero comes along later and it says, oh, I'm going to clear list L. This means that the reference count log for thread one is going to increment and then decrement. And then later, the reference count log for zero is just going to decrement. The problem is, what if we process the log for zero before one? We're going to decrement the reference count. I already told you the reference count was one, so it's going to drop to zero. We're going to deallocate the object. And now uh, we're going to process the commit log for one later, and we're going to explode. We're referencing an uninitialized memory. It might have been freed. It might be another object. Some crazy thing's going to happen. It's not a good idea. We can solve that, actually. Um, oh, by the way, I, I, I want to make it clear. If you were saying, well, what if you just swap those and you did zero in front of one, um, that's not a general solution, because you could have a um, uh, mirrored thing across two threads. You have two lists, two objects. Each thread um, increments over one of the lists and then clears the other one. Um, you can't solve that by reordering the operations here. So what you can do is consider that um, any two operations of Inker and Decker, uh, if you have two operations, one of them is an Inker and a Decker, the other one is an Inker and a Decker, can you swap them? And the answer is, in almost every case you can, if you have two inkers, you can swap them, that's harmless. If you have two deckers, you can swap them, that's harmless. If you have a decker followed by an inker, you can swap them, that's harmless. 
The only time you have a problem is if you have an anchor followed by a decker. If you swap those, you might have an incorrect uh, program now. So with this observation, we don't have to preserve very strict ordering on the operation of anchors and deckers. So we can do this buffered reference counting a lot cheaper by just having two different logs for each thread. One is an anchor log and one is a decker log. And um, all we need to do is be very careful that we process all of the anchors before we process all of the deckers. And now our programs can run com correctly and we have almost no logging. So this solves the problem of having uh, atomic anchor and decker around reference counting. We still have the problem about clearing cache lines. So we can solve that too. Um, there is a technique, um, Thomas Wooters actually got this working in the galactomy thread. Um, it's not ready yet, I think. And he was, he was taking in a kind of a different approach. He had this idea of having um, a different reference count for every object for every thread, and then there would be no contention. I'm not optimistic that that's actually gonna work in the long term, but this is gonna help for buffer reference counting. What we do is we take the object O and we break it into two pieces. We have the reference count separate from the object. And then we push them way apart in memory so they're not next to each other. Now the reference count is gonna be on a different cache line than the object. If we combine that with buffered reference counting, now we have a single thread that's committing the changes and it's making these changes to memory that is way far removed from the object itself, which means that we're not invalidating any of these cache lines anymore. At that point, I'm pretty optimistic that we can get a lot of the, this performance back. So um, uh, remote object headers, Thomas said he had working, so I'm optimistic that that'll work when it comes time to work with it. Um, I've been trying to do buffered reference counting and fundamentally CPython is allergic, as it turns out, to not having reference counts being accurate in real time. So um, it doesn't work right now and I'm gonna have to have my head down and like, debug it for a week and I just haven't had the week to spare recently. Uh, once I get that to work, I'm pretty optimistic that the galactomy is gonna get a lot faster. So where do we go after that? Uh, there's an idea to make objects immortal, uh, or spe specifically reference counts that are immortal. If we had a re an immortal reference count, then we're not changing the memory, which means we're not invalidating cache lines. Um, that could make things faster. Unfortunately, it adds an if statement to basically every anchor and decker. Um, it's hard to, uh, hard to tell without doing an experiment. Uh, thread private locking, the idea here is that uh, most objects never escape the thread in which they were created. So if you create a dict, and you only ever use that dict on the current thread, then you really don't need to do the expensive locking operations around it. Um, it's only when the dict was ever used by a different thread that you would have to actually really lock it and unlock it. And so um, if we could cr lock objects in such a way that the locking was basically free when it was thread local, we could get a bunch of performance back, and I have an idea for how I think I can get that to work. Um, I'm going to have to talk about garbage collection someday in uh, the Galactomy branch. Uh, but again, it's going to be quite a ways away. But uh, in order for it to be code that people can depend on, CPython is going to have to support garbage collection. Um, I think uh, there are a bunch of techniques for garbage collection that support uh, lockless concurrent access. Um, it's super advanced stuff. Um, I completely don't understand it. Um, current CPython garbage collection is basically stop the world garbage collection. That seems like it's acceptable. And I think I can get that to work. So. Um, I think the initial approach is gonna be stop the world. And then if we get this all to work and see Python has this galactomy branch that's actually a viable thing, then the super uh, brainy technologists can come along and fix my garbage collection. Um, one idea, by the way, for uh, making garbage collection not be so expensive, again, there's all this locking involved around it. I think we could do the same thing with buffered reference counting. We could also have buffered tracking and untracking of reference counted objects. Um, just track this object, untrack this object, I write it down in a buffer and have a commit thread that commits them later. Uh, finally, one guy, uh, Eric Snow, I think, suggested that uh, as a way of mitigating the breakage involved around uh, uh, C extensions, we could have the ability to auto-lock C extensions, he called it, where whenever you called into a C extension, there would be an implicit lock involved that would, um, that only one, would prevent more than one thread from running inside of the C extension at a time. And that could probably get a lot of C extensions up and running very quickly. Um, again, it's, this is, um, this is going to be way far down the line before we're going to be ready to look at things like that. So my final thought for you is um, a, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Um, the, the performance looks terrible right now, uh, but this is simply, there's no way to get rid of the gill without starting to get rid of the gill, and this is what starting to get rid of the gill looks like. So I'm still optimistic, even though the numbers are terrible, I'm optimistic that in the long run this is gonna work. 
Thank you. Um, so this is, I think I have about five minutes left for questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, DS Dad. And let's see, we have a question over here. Did you try also with other things uh, other than Fibonacci? Just to something um, more complex uh, computationally, maybe? No, nothing complicated. So again, um, so as it stands, I've added locking around the dict object and the list object. Um, so the dict is safe to use, the list, the list is safe to use. Uh, number, like integers and floats are immutable, so those are safe to use. Anything that's mutable and not in the list that I just said isn't safe to use inside of the galactomy right now. So if you try and do a computation with a set object, you're, uh, it's just gonna blow up. So um, I haven't done any other programs because I didn't think they'd be all that interesting. Uh, and again, this is early days anyway. The really, my, my hope is that there's a lot of work to be done around the galactomy um, adding safety to these other mutable objects like sets and byte arrays and all these sorts of things. And once we got all of those objects to be safe, then we could run any CPython program and we could test that. So I, th that's really where I've spent my time instead. Yes. Um, you might correct me if I'm not right. The uh, stackless approach a couple of years ago, wasn't that also an approach to remove the gill? And can you par compare that? Uh, no, stackless never attempted to remove the gill. Oh, but stackless, okay. the original concept around stackless was, uh, an original, original, like a long time ago. Stackless had been around for a long time. The original idea with stackless was, if you have a Python program, let's say that it's heavily recursive, you run out of stack, and then you get a stack exception, I don't remember what the exception is. Um, if we, because the way that uh, function calls work in CPython is that they're actually implemented using C function calls. So every time you make a function call in Python, it turns into about four function calls in C, and that's building up the C stack, and then you eventually blow the C stack and you're out of memory. If we could separate those two so that whenever you made a function call in Python, all it did was use heap memory, then we could make function calls all the live long day and we never run out of stack. And then all the, uh, all the context for a uh, uh, function call lives in the stack, and now we can very easily switch between function call stacks, which means that we can have coroutines. And so that was kind of the direction the stackless was going, was just separating the Z stack and the function stack, the Python stack. Um, and they haven't used that technique for a long time. They actually do this crazy stuff where they actually take the C stack and they copy it off memory and they copy it some over somewhere, and then they use some assembly language to uh, change stacks, like they change the, the stack pointer and the instruction pointer and jump into another coroutine. But stackless is really more about coroutines anyway. It's never been about removing the gill. So with the uh, approach of, uh, for example, AsyncIO and Twisted and all those asynchronous networking frameworks that tend to handle their own, um, they, they don't use threads, basically. So with the approach of a gelectomy based C Python, so you would run like an async IO reactor in, or async IO event loop, like in each thread, and then what sort of overhead would you um, be looking at, just in theory, um, for those reactors that, uh, that never ever uh, talk between threads? Well, well the theory, is that these would be completely divorced and adding more cores would make your program scale linearly. In practice, I don't think we're ever gonna get there. Um, but, um, uh, so the, the answer to, that question is the answer to all the other questions about performance, which is that um, the galactomy becomes interesting at the point at which you can add cores to a program and it gets faster rather than slower. Um, and again, it's gonna be a long time before we get there. Um, I, in general, um, how does the galectomy affect Twisted and other async I.O. and asynchronous programming things? Um, I can only think that it would be good for them, just like every other program. Uh, in particular, like that sounds, that sounds like a reasonably parallel program. Like these things should run in parallel, and the, the, reason, the, the reason that we run them on multiple cores, the reason that we don't run them on multiple cores right now is because of the gill, but they're already basically parallel operations anyway. Um, you're going to have to eat the locking overhead, of course, but you're going to be able to have multiple programs, multiple threads running simultaneously on the same code base with the same local data store, all the local objects that are in CPython. So I think it's like, I'll put it this way, 
if it doesn't make your program faster, then switch to the single threaded version and you'll be happy. Thank you. Okay, one more question, and Larry will be on the core developers panel later. Yeah. I'd be happy to answer questions. About, uh, go ahead. I'd be happy to answer questions about the galactomy during the core developers panel, um, which starts at 3:45 today, and I'm chairing, so I'm uh, forced to attend and stay for the whole time. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Uh, have you considered keeping C extension compatibility with, for example, like a global interpreter lock? just for C extensions, like with reader-writer locks? Well, um, I've considered it. Um, it doesn't work. Um, uh, the problem, anytime that you, the, the, the problem is that um, if you had a global uh, lock that you just used for C extensions, you have code that isn't paying any attention to it, it's gonna be changing state, the C extension expected that change th the state doesn't change from out from underneath its feet because it's holding the lock right now. Now your program is incorrect. So it's just not a, it's, it's a non-starter. Okay, thank you very much, Larry. Let's give him a big hand.